Now, in the time that's left to me, I haven't, I can't go over very much, but I thought I'd take three examples of what I mean about how damaging this way of thinking can be. And the first one is really just to demonstrate how absurd it is. In my life, and maybe in yours, one of the most meaningful things of all is music. Now, if you take music apart, you get phrases, and then finally you get notes. And then you go, oh, at last, I've put it into my cloud chamber and I can definitively affirm that music is made of notes. Um, round of applause. Now, what is a note? Once we know what a note is, we can work out what music is. Um, but of course, a note is, well, nothing really. It's just a meaningless sound. Um, and if you put um, thousands and thousands and thousands of these together, you get Mozart's G minor quintet, which probably means more than anything that you can encounter in the world. How does that happen? It can't be in the notes. We've established that because one note means nothing, two notes mean nothing, three notes mean nothing, and presumably, therefore, 35,000 notes mean nothing. So it must be in something else. Well, the only things that there are are gaps. There's just silence, which is the gaps between the notes in the melody, the gaps between the notes in the harmony as they occur at the same time, and the ictus of the way in which the thing moves. But the silence on its own doesn't mean anything either. So this is a perfect example of a gestalt. And to me, a much better image of the universe is a symphony or a dance or a beautiful piece of choral music rather than a machine. I don't just say that in some um, flowery poetic way. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with the in insights of poetry, um, but I mean it in a very deep philosophical way that we misunderstand it. And of course, the other thing about music is that it simply cannot be understood except in an act of encounter. It's not there and you can look at it and go away and inspect it. You have to encounter it. Now that is a very good image of everything in our lives, everything in our experience, and I would say of the nature of the cosmos. The second thing that I would look at is something that will take me a little bit longer, but which is really very important to me because after all, uh, I'm a doctor, um, I worked in the area of neurology and psychiatry, and very prominent in the life sciences, as they're called, is the image of the machine. Now, physics, curiously, moved on from um, the image of a machine about 100 years ago. It decided that simply the cosmos is nothing like anything mechanical at all. However, this message hasn't got through to certain prominent public intellectuals in the realm of the biological sciences who carry on in an, a perfect frock-coated mid-19th century way to see uh, the whole business of the living world as mechanical. And we must stop conceiving of not only living beings as things, uh, sorry, not as just as machines, but as things at all. They're processes. And in the last 18 months, I've been very excited by discovering a book called Everything Flows, quoting Heraclitus, the greatest philosopher that ever lived. And it's by uh, Dupre and Nicholson, published by OUP. Uh, and I do recommend it to everyone. I, I think on a policy of OUPs, you can, in fact, read it online for free. Um, and it has an uh, enormous amount in it. But it effectively takes apart the idea that living beings are anything at all like a machine. And the information in it is staggering. What is fascinating, of course, is that at one level, of course, neurology, at least neuroscience, uh, which is perhaps a, a less humane thing than neurology, where you were forced to confront suffering humanity every day. Uh, in neuroscience in the lab, you're not. It's easier to think of what you're looking at as just some little circuit or some, something mechanical. And so the language of neuroscience is full of feedback loops, um, uh, circuits, gates that open and close, and um, parcels of information and so forth. Whereas, um, in fact, when people start talking about cells, including neurons, but all cells, they 
cannot help using a language which absolutely wouldn't be necessary or tolerated in physics or chemistry. They talk about a cell designing something, helping something, um, forming something, um, promoting something, uh, interpreting something, messaging something, all things that only living things actually do. There's a lot to say about that disjunct, but let me just allow that to, to tick away there. And then, of course, we've inherited from Richard Dawkins this very silly idea that we are just um, the tools of machine-like robots um, that enable them to do whatever it is they do. Interestingly, this is actually just a transposition of the idea of an engineering god. It's saying that we don't do things, something else does things to us and controls us, except that his idea of the engineering god is contained in a gene. And I, I don't hold with an engineering god. A god, depending on what it means, may be, but that's another matter. Well, first of all, genes don't determine very much at all. They are, according to Lewontin, who's a very great biologist, some of the most inactive molecules in biology. They are more like a storehouse on which the cell can draw as it needs. The cell acts on the genome. And in fact, in some creatures, this is an extreme case, but we all living creatures do it up to a point, but there is a very small single celled organism that regularly junks about 90% of its genome and refashions the order of the rest on orders from the cell. And that's a huge thing. When we'd finished this heroic task of decoding the genome, we found that there was just not enough information there. The image that always comes to mind, I'm sure all of us over a certain age at any rate have seen faulty towers, possibly more than once. And there is a wonderful episode, probably the best of the whole lot, where um, uh, the, the chef has got drunk and Basil Fawlty has to go and get a duck from his friend uh, Andre, a chef in town, and comes back smirking, pushing his trolley with the silver uh, dish, and he pulls the lid off, and there's a blancmange. And she says nothing, but just goes, and then goes, ducks off. Um, and that's the end. But I'm afraid the discovery at the end of this trail of the genome is just like that. It's not there. How many genes does the human being have? About 26,000, actually, depending on what you define as a gene. You might think a gene is a clear, discrete concept, but actually it's not. But we normally say about 26,000, whereas a blind millimeter long um, worm, C. Uh, uh, elegans, uh, has 19,000. Um, a very small water flea called Daphnia pulex has, I think, 39,000. And the biggest genome of all is one species of amoeba that has something like 200 times as much genomic content as the human genome. Now, on top of that, only 2% of the genome is thought actually to be um, active. I mean, we'll probably discover um, how foolish that idea is, but at the moment, 98% is called junk DNA. It doesn't leave you very much with which to conjure the extraordinary complexity. So that in even one single cell, 10,000 different reactions are going on every second with pathways that are not simple and discrete, but interlock with one another. So what is important is the system as a whole, not just the genome, but the genome and the cell and the surrounding tissue and the whole being in which the whole thing is going on. Now, one of the first things that alerts you to the fact that organisms are not like cell and not like machines is that machines can be switched on and off. People can't, nor can hamsters. Um, but every machine I know can be switched on and off. You can switch it off for a few years, you can come, you can start it up, and on the whole, you will hope that after a few hiccups, it will carry on doing whatever it was doing. Now, that's not actually a small point, is what is happening is that there is a continuous process. We are processes, not things, not even aggregates of things. And what has to be 
explained in the human being is not motion, as in a machine. How does this come to move? Well, because we burn a lot of things in a power station, we plug it in and it then starts moving, then we switch it off. No, we change all the time to remain the same. In fact, this is a saying of Heraclitus is, by changing, it remains the same. And this is absolutely true of a cell or of all, any living thing. In fact, the interesting thing is that in Greek, the word for change there is metabalon, which is basically the word in metabolism. So what we are doing, metabolizing, is changing all the time. And when you see a picture of a cell in a, a, a microphotograph or in a, a drawing in a textbook, it looks like it has clear boundaries. But actually, it's not. Those boundaries that look solid are actually fluid. And things are coming into them and going out of them all the time. They're more like rivers than they are like walls. The process of evolution as well, natural selection. Natural selection is not the, the bringer of change. Change is there automatically in nature all the time, fluidly changing in response to the environment. It's a dance. Natural selection is a stabilizer. It goes, hang on, hang on we quite like that one. Uh, we're going to fix it. So it's actually not what it is often taken to be. Nor are these systems uh, linear systems in any sense at all. I've already mentioned that they often have recursive loops in which they act on themselves. Um, and in fact, Sidney Brenner, who won a Nobel Prize for his work in genetics, says that basically in the cell, it's everything doing everything to everything else. So um, the idea that one can get to simplicity as one goes on the way down is absolutely not right. Nor can you fix anything as a single component because everything is interdependent. So everything depends on its place in the whole. Um, in a machine, you know you've got a widget or a tappet or whatever it is, and you can take it out, rub it clean, put it back in again, whatever. But in a human or a, an animal or a single cell or the, the, the simplest living thing, you you don't have this business of independence. There's a very nice little book by a quite young um, microbiologist called Kriti Sharma um, called Interdependence, uh, which I found very impressive, um, in which she says it's not just, as we know, that the organism is always in dialogue with the environment, because one tends to think that the organism has an effect on the environment, and then the, organ the environment has an effect on the organism, and then, etc. But it's not, and then. The two come into being together because of one another, rather like the piece of music. Nor is it in any sense a predictable matter what a gene will do. It depends entirely on the context. In a very gross way, for example, um, probably any of you who've done school biology will know that the eye of a fly, compound eye, the eye of a frog and a human eye are really very different, both to look at in how, and in how they function. But the principal gene that codes for them is the same in every case. It's PAX6. I mean, of course, there are other gen genomic differences, but the point I'm making is this, that what a gene does can't be predicted until you know pretty much about everything about all the other genes. So that a single gene can produce as many as 2,000 different proteins on different occasions. So what does it code for is not a straightforward matter. And indeed, while the same outcome can be derived from a number of different genetic cellular streams, equally, the same elements can give rise to many, many different outcomes. So, as it were, in both directions, you've got a fan, not a straight line. So the whole is very important in its influence. And of course, again, living things, as I've rather emphasized, don't have precise boundaries. Um, uh, I, I mean, of course, psychically, one may well know that, but I mean, it's not foreign at all to mainstream biology that the brain and the heart give off waves that are detectable within feet around it. But also that, you know, I am partly what my environment uh, gives to me and what I give to it. There isn't a sharp boundary at the edge of me. And of course, the final thing is that um, living things bootstrap. 
they're often compared with, you know, mindlessly to computers. But it's not for a computer. A computer can build another computer, but it already has to have the information. Um, it doesn't generate the information in the process of becoming the machine. You can't just put a lot of things together and hope that they will generate information at the same time as the thing that the, gen the information refers to. Um, and in this, living things are again very different. So I would suggest that a much better image for all living things and quite possibly for inanimate things, which I don't think are wholly distinct from living things. I think they are, if you like, a limit case of the living, but that would take us away from, I can't cover that now. But the, a better image would be the flow of life or the stream of life um, than that of the machine. And there's nothing nebulous about that. A stream has enormous force. It can change things. It can move boulders. It creates whirlpools that you can photograph that will propel you. So it's very, very real, um, except that each eddy in the stream, each part of the flow is not in any sense disconnected from any other part in the flow.